the second uh, week of a series called I Am Jesus. It's really looking at the life of Christ and all that Jesus, a lot of things that Jesus came to do. There's no way that we could cover all that he came to do. The Bible says there are even volumes that are written about him that were never even recorded. Uh, just so much stuff. Uh, God didn't just create you to be yourself. God didn't create you to create your own little kingdom and your own little world and just to kind of store up for yourselves and kind of create your own little empire. But he really created you to use you and to equip you and to love you and to love other people through you. And he's equipped you with the power of his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit gives you uh, that contribution that you can make. And so before Jesus went to the cross, he uh, was actually talking to his heavenly father. And here's what he said in John chapter 17, verse 18, our very first verse. He said this, in the same way that you have given me a mission in the world, I give them a mission. Now, one of the greatest tragedies, I think, in life is to never discover your mission, never really discover or make a contribution, and never really, you know, pour into other people's lives, kingdom things that will make an eternity uh, in heaven. Now, if you, don't, if you cannot think of one person who's going to be in heaven because of you, I mean, think about that right now. Who's going to be in heaven because of you? If you can't think of at least one person, I would say you have your work cut out for you or several people. Uh, after the resurrection, Jesus gets really specific. And here's what he says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will be my witnesses. I want to stop there. He didn't say you will be my attorneys. You don't have to fight for Jesus. You don't have to argue for Jesus. Somebody posts something on Facebook. You don't have to say, well, I think this. Well, I think that. He says you'll be my witnesses. In where? Would you say that place out loud? Jerusalem, right? Uh, let's say it out loud again. And where? Jerusalem. Okay, that's like your own hometown. And then it says where? In? Say it. You don't have it? Did you not get the scripture? Serious. Okay, that's fine. Let me just read it to you. Okay, so you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's like your own hometown. He says in Judea. Now that's like in your culture, cross-cultural. Uh, we went to, uh, Michelle and I went Friday night uh, to uh, Club Outreach. It is uh, by Nightlight Ministries, and that was a culture that I have never experienced before. The guys did not go in. The guys stay outside, and we pray for those ladies that are going in. Uh, and so that's going cross-cultural. It's stepping out of your comfort zone. It's, say, it's saying, well, you know, I could probably never do this, but I'm going to do it because I've got the power of God in me. So that's cross-cultural. And some amazing things uh, happened, uh, by the way. And then he says, to the ends of the, wor uh, end of the world. So here's what I want you to get. Going into all the world is personal, all right? It's local and it's global. That's what Jesus says. It's personal, it's local, and it's global. So how do I do that? Did you get sermon? You got the sermon notes, right? Right? Okay, do you see, uh, how do I succeed in my mission with God? Are we tracking? Do you have that? Okay, so fortunately, do you have Luke chapter 10? Okay, that's, now we're all tracking, right? Say, all right. Say, we're tracking. Would you do that? Okay, we're tracking. So I just want to make sure. Uh, there's going to be some other things I'm going to throw up there too, so, so uh, that, that may, be, may not be in your notes. But Jesus gave us an example. And I'm so excited about this example before he, uh, you know, sent them out. Uh, uh, you know, th 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 this, uh, th th he gave us these instructions. These instructions that Jesus gave still work today. Here's what I came to tell you this morning. They'll work in your office. They will work for you personally. This is not just a church thing. This is not just for pastors. This is for everybody. If you have a vision or if you have a passion about something that you believe God has called you to do, this is the plan that Jesus would give you. Uh, it will work. Uh, we used this plan when we started Lake Hills Church uh, six years ago. We, we will follow the, the, these exact steps. Uh, the, these plans will work and something that, uh, that you feel like God is calling you to do. These steps that we're going to talk about today, uh, uh, Back to School Bash, it's a perfect example of what is happening with Back to School Bash. And any outreach that we do, the, I want to give you some principles that God gives us in his word that you will follow and they will work beyond a shade of a shadow of a doubt. So if there's ever been a time that you needed a business plan or a kind of a model of something, uh, maybe you could kind of just have a re, uh, affirmation or confirmation of what uh, the track that you're on, uh, then you would follow these principles. So the first one is this principle of, of uh, cooperation. 
Uh, he says get a partner. That's the fill in there. So get a, get a partner. It's all about partnership. Uh, at Lake Hills Church, we don't necessarily have membership. I've been in a lot of churches where uh, it was run by, I mean, it was, it, was, it was mainly filled up with church members who really didn't do a whole lot. They just said, well, I have, I'm a member. I've got my name on the roll. And, uh, you know, if you ever want to kill something, give it to a committee. Can I give it amen? <laughs> I mean, if you ever want to just see something not go anywhere, just give it to a committee. And a commit, what a committee will do is a committee will sit around a table and discuss things. We ought to do this. Well, we ought to do that. Hey, and then they'll just say, well, let's table it till the next month and we'll f- try to figure it out. Now, the difference in a committee, the opposite of that is a team. Teams, uh, teams work. To make the, te- the dream work, you've got to have teamwork. And I'm so glad that Lake Hills Church is a place of team working people. Now, you've got to get a partner. It's all about relationships and building relationships and working together uh, through relationships. So that's what we try to do around here, to love God and to love people and try to make it as simple as possible. So now let's start together with Luke chapter 10, verse 1. Here's what he says. The Lord appointed 72 others. Now this is besides the 12 disciples. The Lord appointed 72 people to go out that would precede his message, his, his, uh, his uh, announcement. Now this was after John the Baptist had baptized Jesus, after he'd gone into the wilderness, after he'd gone to Nazareth, and after he'd been to Galilee and those things that we talked about last uh, week. Uh, the Lord sent out 72 others, and he sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and to every place he was about to go. So in other words, Jesus was saying, hey, grab a friend, grab a coworker. Now, as we press on with back to school bash, I mean, you need to really be thinking about, hey, who can I grab? What kind of a friend or a coworker or someone that I can say, hey, will you join us? Now, if you've come to Lake Hills Church for a week, I, I've, I'm already just thinking, hey, you're invited to invite someone. You don't have to go through a big, long uh, thing about membership or all those things. This is about partnership. So you might write down a single somebody, uh, someone's name there, who can I grab? Now, the second way, Uh, that we're going to be successful in our mission is this principle of expectation. I cannot stress this enough, and we say this all the time. You have to depend on God. You must depend on God to make it happen. Now, you don't depend on your talent. And I tell these people all the time, my my son is an amazing worship leader. He plays the guitar. He has amazing talent. I told him a long time ago, Benji, uh, talent might get you there, but it will not keep you there. You gotta, it's going to take more than talent. It's going to take more than your own creativity. I mean, you know, this room's filled with creative people, but every once in a while you're going to be tapped out of your creativity. You must depend on God. It's going to take more than money. It's going to take more than connections or networking. Uh, you must depend on God. It's interesting, the very first thing that Jesus said when he sent them out in verse 4, he says, don't take a purse. Now, this is interesting. Why would he say, don't take a purse? In fact, he mentions it three times in three different places. He says in Matthew chapter 10, he says, don't take along any gold or silver or copper. In in Mark 6, he says, take no money in your pockets. Now, what is he talking about? What he's talking about is you must depend on God and not your money. He's not saying don't take money. He's just saying don't depend on your money to make it happen. Now, I've traveled around the world. I've been to many missions places. I've been to the poorest of the poor. And here's what I've found. The poor have a lot more faith than rich people do. They do. The poor have a lot more faith than rich people do. Why is that? Well, depending on money can make you less dependent on God. When I, when I just depend on money, I can be less dependent on money. So don't lead your life with your money. Don't lead your life with what you have. You must depend on God. Because what happens is a rich person, you, if you need something, you know, it's so easy to say, well, let's just go buy this. I'll just go put this on my credit card. Or I'll just go buy this. Whenever I need something, I just go out and buy it. I don't depend on God. When was the last time I, before I made a purchase? I'm talking about just a purchase. I'm not talking about a major purchase. I'm talking about when was the last time I made a purchase and I said, God, do I really need this? God, help me with this decision. Now, I don't want to make it so simple that that, that you go, come on, Jack, you're dumbing this down way too much. I say that to help you to understand you must depend on God, period. When you're poor and you have nothing, 
you depend on God. So that's why James says in James chapter 2, verse 5, the poor are rich in faith. So really right now, if, you're, if you feel like you're poor and you really don't have nothing, hey, congratulations, you're rich in faith. You have faith. They have more faith uh, than, than a lot of times. It's, it's harder. Now, I'm not saying because you have money, you have no faith. I'm just saying it's easy not to depend on God when you have money. So he's saying don't make uh, don't take any money. He, he, uh, he's saying, don't think that money is going to bail you out of all your issues. It's not. You must depend on me to bail you out of all of your issues. Don't throw your money at the problem. Don't just say, well, let's just throw money at it. God wants you uh, to be thrown at it. And so don't depend on, on money. Depend on God. So there's a, there's a third principle. He says, don't take a purse. And then he says this. The third principle is this. It's simplification. I really like this. I like simple. If you come in here and you don't really understand a whole lot about what we're doing and what we're about, you need to let me know because we need to challenge that process and make it even more simple. We need to break it down even more. Don't, uh, he says this, uh, princi- the principle of simplification is this, keep it simple. Now I wrote it down on your notes, K-I-S-S, uh, keep it simple, sweetie, right? Okay, so you've heard it maybe the other way, but, but uh, here's what he says <laughs> in, uh, in verse 4. He goes on to say, don't take a traveler's bag or even an extra pair of sandals when you go on your mission. Now, he's not saying don't take any luggage. He's not saying, you know, don't pack for the trip. He's just saying travel light. And I'd parallel that thinking with this. Uh, we need to all, including myself, create margin in our life. We are so busy uh, doing things that God never even int- intended us to be so busy. And we wear our big- busyness on a ba- like a badge that we're proud of how busy we are. And uh, we need to leave some margin in our lives. So you can say, okay, I'm, I've got so many hours in a day, and I'm going to leave a bit of margin on each side of that day for my family, for my faith, for my friends, and just to be still and know that he's God. If you're busy, too busy right now for those things, then that's just a little warning light that you're too busy. And God never intended you to be that busy. So I wrote a little question here for you. What distracts me? Right now, I'm just imagining in a room this, uh, with this full, there's a lot of distractions with people. You might have some financial distractions right now. You might have some distractions that you uh, are carrying from work, and, uh, you know, they're just distractions. You might have some relationship distractions. That's why Paul says, throw off those things that so easily entangle you. You might be distracted by something. You just need to say, okay, that's just a warning light. I need to get, I need to get this figured out in my life so that it will no longer be a distraction. Keep life simple. That's the third principle. The fourth one is this. Jesus says it's the principle of concentration. It's the, it's the, the principle of concentration. That's just the principle of focus to be focused. That's the fourth thing in verse four, actually uh, 4b. It says this, don't stop and greet anyone along the road. Now, why would he say that? Well, again, this is a cultural thing. In the Middle East, when you were walking on the road, why would Jesus say, don't stop and greet somebody on the road? Well, they knew what he meant, but we don't all know what he meant because we weren't living in that time. But here's what he meant. He meant, don't stop and greet some people on the road because in that culture, when you stop to greet someone on the road, that greeting would take hours. It may even take a day. It may take uh, more than a day. When you would greet someone, it was the practice of their culture in this New Testament time. You would stop and you would visit, and then that person would probably invite you over to their house because they didn't have hotels. They didn't have restaurants. They'd probably invite you in for something to eat. And so that would take hours, and and it would take maybe a day. And it, it meant a lot of rituals. And Jesus says, don't, 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 uh, don't get distracted. Hey, stay focused. Jesus is just saying uh, it's easy to be distracted when you're serving God. I call it when and then thinking. Uh, A lot of people have good intentions. A lot of people have God intentions. A lot of people say, well, I'll serve God. I'm going to really get serious about my faith when uh, and then, you know, and all that kinds of uh, of thinking. So I'm going to get serious about serving. I'm going to get serious about giving. I'm going to get serious about uh, following. Uh, I'm going to get serious about my relationship with God. And then I'll just list a whole bunch of things. When the, when the kids come, when the kids leave home, when I get the job, when I find another job, when I retire, when I do this and when I do that. And pretty soon you've lived your whole life with these good intentions. 
And, uh, and he's just saying here, uh, don't get distracted. So that's the principle number four. The principle number five is this principle of affirmation. And I love this principle because it says begin with a blessing. And it works. This, this, this principle works in your office. This principle works in your church. This principle works really anywhere. And here's what it means. The next thing Jesus says in verses 5 and 6 when he's sending them out. He says, when you enter a house, uh, when you enter a place where you work, when you enter uh, the new thing or the new place that's new to you, the church, whatever, when you enter the house. Now, in those days, they didn't have any hotels, so they, they went to people's homes a lot. He says, first, say these words, peace be to this house. Now, if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Jesus is saying if there are like-minded people that are followers of God and you say, hey, peace be to you or shalom uh, or, you know, some kind of a greeting in the name of God and the man of God or the woman of God hears that, they're going to say, hey, I kind of like that too. I I believe in God too. It works anywhere. I was pumping gas one day. I was talking to a guy and he was the next thing. I was talking about God. And I said something like that to, to him, and we, we struck up this conversation. Some guy clear from Illinois. I didn't even know. In 30 seconds, I found out he was a follower of Jesus and that we we're brothers in Christ. Just at the gas station. This works anywhere. Your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. So you say shalom or you say something about God or a godly greeting. And if they don't receive it, then God is saying that will still return to you. So don't say it just for fear that they won't be receivers of peace. You say it anyway. It's called being bold and walking uh, uh, in your faith and walking in love. Now, Jesus always blessed people everywhere that he went. This is so amazing when you study it out. He, He blessed them with a look or a word or a touch everywhere that he went. I want you to be thinking, who can you be blessing this week? He would give them a look of understanding. Now, don't ever say, I understand what you're going through unless you've gone through it. Because you may not understand what they're going through. Some of you do. So hide it under a bush, oh no, let it shine. Some of you have gone through horrendous divorce, and you know the pain of that, and you can help somebody else who's gone through divorce. And you can help them, and you can encourage them, and you can say, I understand what you're going through. I can't say that. I've never gone through that. Some of you have gone through some physical problems, and you can say, look, I understand what you're going through. Some of you have been through some financial problems, and you can say, I understand completely what you're going through. The problem is, is in the church world, we like to wear masks, so we pretend that we're, we don't have any problems, and nobody knows what we're going through. My prayer is that Lake Hills Church will be in such a vulnerable place that people will know, hey, this is a good place to be vulnerable. That's what Jesus did. He gave them the look of understanding. I may not understand what you're going through, but I want you to know I'm praying for you. Jesus gave them a word of encouragement. Hey, you're going to make it. This may look like it's going to take you out, but you're going to make it. You're going to get through this. It's all going to be okay. A touch, a touch of affirmation, a handshake, a pat on the back, uh, attaboy, a smile. Try it sometime. When you're walking into the office and you smile at somebody or you're just walking out on the street, if you're just walking in the mall, try it. I've tried it. It works. Just smile at somebody. 99% of the time, they will smile back. It's the look. It's the word. It's the touch. That's how you bless people because everybody on this planet needs those three things. Everybody needs those three things. You're fulfilling the mission of God when you do that. You're blessing other people when you do that. Look all around you. I want you to write down, just fill this in. Who can I bless this week? I want to ask you to really write someone's name down. Think of, really burn their, their name and, and their, 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 their face right now in your mind. Because only you might be able to reach them. Uh, don't be calling, hey, Pastor Jack, can you come over and see this person? No, you're the one that already has a relationship with them. You go see them. You, you, you go up to them Monday morning and say, look, I've been praying for you. I just want you to know. Blow, it'll blow them away. What? And if that's too much, just say, look, hey, how you doing today? I just stopped by. I never come by your cubicle or whatever. I just want to stop by and say hello. You do that. That's the, uh, that's the fifth or the sixth. Uh, is that five or six? That's five. Uh, who can I bless this week? Uh, number six is the principle of incarnation. I love this about God. 
The principle of incarnation is invest time to build relationships. That's what God did when he sent his very son, Jesus. What's the word incarnation mean? It means in the flesh. Jesus came in the flesh. He came, um, you know, in as a human being with skin and bones on. Fully God, fully man, the Bible says. The Bible says in, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, this verse, it says, the Word became flesh, meaning incarnate, meaning God with us, and made his dwelling among us. I like the message version. It says, and moved into the neighborhood. And I imagine it, it, God is so cross-cultural. He's not, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, and white. He is cross-cultural. You know, when, when, you, when you read that, he moved into the neighborhood, maybe in the inner city somewhere, and God moved into the hood. I mean, God speaks to them and to you and to us and to whoever, and he loves us all the same. I always say the ground is level at the foot of the cross. God is so cross-cultural. He is so colorblind. God came for every single person, the rich, the poor, the black, the white, the yellow, the, 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 the indignant, those that thumb their nose at him. God loves everyone, and he loves, you just think right now, the worst person that you know. God loves you as much as he loves them. That blows me away. Incarnate. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I love that. That's what it means to invest time in relationships. Did you know it, it doesn't really take a lot? It, do, it's not, it doesn't take rocket science to invest in relationships. 90% of it is just showing up. Just showing up <laughs> when the doors are open, when the small group is there, just showing up, just being there. And even when you go to a funeral, you really don't have to say anything. You just show up. They're not going to remember what you said anyway. You were there. You showed up. You invested in relationships. That's the principle of incarnation. There's a seventh principle, and it really is important in your mission. No matter what your mission is, whether it's a God mission or a, you know, a, a church mission or an outreach mission, any kind of a mission, it's the, the principle of accommodation. I like this. Adapt to local tastes. Adapt to local tastes. When Jesus was sending them out in verse 7 and 8, he said, eat and drink whatever they give you. When you enter a house or a town and are welcomed, eat what they set before you. I remember we went on a missions trip one time to uh, Tegucigalpa, Ecuador, or was it Honduras? Honduras. So anyway, if you've ever been there, Tegucigalpa is like this range of mountains. And then you, the, the plane full of people, it didn't have any chickens on it or anything like that, but it's like it was full of people. Uh, we were already in the culture when we got on the plane. It was one of those deals. You know what I'm saying? So when you come into Tegucigalpa, you actually come over this mountain, these steep mountains and all this. And, and, the, and then the pilot just has to really set the plane down in order to land the plane before he gets to the end of the runway. It's one of those deals. It's a, it's, it's a crazy place to land. But so we went, we went to the, uh, our, our, our mission that, that uh, two weeks we were there, I think it was 10 days, two weeks, uh, was on the edges of town, really by the dumps in the town. It was really ministering to the poorest of the poor. And I mean, you know, I've said everybody lives in America is rich. I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. You, you're rich. You may not like it. Get over it. You're rich. These people were poor. Their, their floor in their house was dirt. Their house, their whole house with a lot, like nine people was about as big as this stage right here. That was as big as their house. A bed over there, bed over there, cooking kind of area over here, and just whatever. You know, I don't know. It's all kind of stacked up. They were poor. And I mean, just like stuff propped up uh, out of cardboard, out of their house, old signs, just anything you could think of. I mean, twine, and they just didn't throw anything away. I remember the mom of like seven or eight kids, and Michelle and I were in their house, and they invited us into their home, and, uh, and uh, there was like a corner store, if you'd want to call it that, where the guy just set out stuff to sell trinkets and stuff, and, and she said something to him. Pretty soon he came back, and he came back with one bottle of pop. It was a big deal. 
or soda or whatever you call it. One bottle. And uh, we were going to split that up between all eight or nine of us. And so she goes to getting her glasses, what were glasses or little containers, little cups and whatever off of her shelf. And they were all dirty. It's like, I'm thinking, okay, so she's going to pour that in there. And some of you know I'm already kind of a germaphobe, right? And I'm supposed to drink that? And, uh, and then immediately that, this verse came to my mind. And we drank it and we fellowshiped with them. Paul said this, and this is not in your notes. He says, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. He's saying, I'm going to adapt. I entered their world and I tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet in a God-saved life. One whole reason that you are on a mission is so that you can learn to adapt so in the church world, we want people to believe, to behave, and to become. Can they still come if they don't believe? Can they still come if they don't behave? I would hope so. I think so. But that's what he says, well, I want you to adapt. Here's the verse that's it. that is in your nose, 1 Corinthians 10, 33. Paul says, I try to accommodate everybody in everything. That's the principle of of accommodation. That's adapting. When your server gets your order wrong, do you adapt or do you go off? Most Christians who are being served today won't even tip. Those are the facts. I try to accommodate everybody and everything, not looking for my own advantage, but for the advantage of everybody else so that they may be saved. Are we having fun yet? Everybody say amen. We got to say this. We got to have these conversations in church. We got to adapt. The eighth principle Jesus gives us is this principle of alleviation. And this is, I think, where the rubber meets the road. Begin where they hurt. Begin where they hurt. You don't begin with your agenda. It's not about you. When they're talking, you listen. You don't think about what you're going to say while they're talking. You let them talk. And then you listen to them. You begin uh, with what uh, uh, they do, what they like to do, what they think and what they need and all those things. And here it is in verse 9. Jesus said this, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Now, friends, there's all kinds of sickness. There's physical sickness and those are sometimes the first things that we see, but there are so many uh, deeper sicknesses. There are a lot of people who are sick. They're filled with pride and ego and uh, insecurity, hidden wounds, a certain sin that they won't let go of, certain sin that they're, that they're courting or, or that's over here and saying, well, that's not going to affect me. And they're just kind of like walking to the edge all the time or over the edge. Certain insecurity, certain fears, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, Jesus said it was, it's not the sick uh, or the well that need the doctor, it's the sick. And everybody in this room has emotional and hidden hurts and wounds and God says, bring them to me. He's saying, first find a hurt. Uh, and fill it. Find a need uh, or a problem and solve it. If you can just find a problem, you found a ministry because you can solve it. If you can just find a hurt, you found a ministry because you can solve it. Start with their agenda. Uh, what, what's the key uh, to, that unlocks the door? It's always a hurt. Uh, you can take the roughest, meanest person in your office and, and the reason they're so mean and ugly is because they're hurting. Hurt people hurt people. That's why they're that way. If you can find out the way, or the reason that they're hurt, you can fill that need. There's always a hurt. There's always a need. There's always an interest. People don't care how much you know. They don't really care where you go to church. They don't care if you go to church. But if there's a need and you can find it and you can fill it, then that's going to be amazing. The Bible tells us that Jesus went into every village doing these three things. This is so amazing to me. He went preaching, he went teaching, and he went healing. Now, most of us make Jesus all about salvation. We just want to tell everybody, hey, just come to Jesus and get saved. <laughs> One third of Jesus' ministry was about going to heaven. That's uh, soul, uh, that, that's preaching. Uh, One third of his uh, ministry was about 
uh, the mind, that's teaching. One third of his ministry was about the body, that's healing. Soul, mind, and body. Jesus is saying, I can give you whatever you need. Because a lot of people's minds are hurting. A lot of people's bodies are hurting. A lot of people need salvation. But Jesus didn't just care about salvation. He cared about education. He cared about back-to-school bash. He cared about meeting people's needs with sports physicals. And he, he cared about, uh, you know, the, the, the kicked out and the, the downcast. Uh, they said it cost about $600 per family to go back to school. And I'm glad that this church is partnering with others to make this happen this year. Why, why is Jesus saying that? Because Jesus is a teacher. Jesus is a healer. Jesus is a savior. I could go on and on about that. But let's go to number nine, the principle of mobilization. And this is where we need your help. And then I'm about done. Pray for others to join us. It's not about networking. It's not about manipulation. It's not about trying to get people to do something. It's just praying that God send people to join us. This, we were over our head the first year we did Backstool Bash. You all, some of you know that, that we're here. First year we were over our head. I, I want us to uh, look at this verse in Luke chapter 10, verse 2. These were his, talking about Jesus, instructions to the 31 teams that he sent out. The harvest is great. So look around the world. The harvest is great. I, sometime I think about God, how, how are we going to do this? Seven billion people on the planet right now. Seven billion reasons why we should care. He says, but the workers are so few. Pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. So in other words, God's not surprised by all this. God works all things together for the good. And he's gonna, he's, somehow he's going to change this whole thing around when the time is right. Personally, I believe we're going to have a worldwide revival. I believe that. I believe that's going to happen. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it because he's God. And ask him to send out the more workers for his field. God wants everybody to know him. So what do we do? We pray for a, a, a heart and a church that cares. And I, I think we're well on our way there. So many people insist on living for themselves. Uh, so many people, uh, you know, we have gotten so good about being so calloused about really what God wants us to do that we kind of already know we're almost too big for our britches. <laughs> we already know too much. And most people, the fact is this, most people insist on living for themselves, period. Jesus says in Mark 8, 35, if you insist on saving your life, you will lose it. Only those who throw away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it really means to live. I mean, you want to live. Start living for somebody else, not yourself. It's opposite world. Sometimes I think about, wow, the task is so huge and the critics are out there and whatever. And, you know, I've learned a long time not even listen to the voices of the critics. Just do what God tells you and just keep on going. Reminds me of that guy, and you probably heard that story about this big storm that blew in. And he was walking along the, uh, the beaches one morning and all, noticed all these thousands and tens of thousands of starfish that had, you know, kind of washed up on the shore. And this one guy, is bending down and he's picking all these starfish up trying to save their lives and he's zinging them back into the ocean. Just one guy picking them up. You know, people would kind of walk by. What's he doing? Not even helping. Just kind of walk. Another guy walked by. What are you doing? Well, I'm picking up these starfish. All these starfish? Are you sure? You're going to pick up all these fish? Well, what possible difference could you make in, in, in the life of that, those starfish? How, how could that even possibly matter? And they got to even look up. He didn't even acknowledge this critic. And he just kept throwing the starfish in. And then he started saying, well, it matters. It matters to that one. 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 And as long as he could by himself, as long as he had the ability that day, he kept picking up starfish. It matters. I'm telling you, friends, this morning, what Jesus says matters. This matters just as much today as it did then. It matters. This is the only path. He is the only one and true God. It matters. Let's pray together. God, we want to do this, but we need your help. We want to build relationships out of love so, God, that we can walk across that bridge and we, we can just help people to walk across the bridge and, 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 and they can find Jesus. God, I want to be willing to adapt, to do those things that 
aren't particularly comfortable for me, but they're so beneficial for you and for your kingdom. God, there's so much at stake. How many start living for the benefit of others? And I want to begin where other people are hurting. I want to commit to praying for other people and to join the army of compassion, which is so uh, unusual today. God, I commit to practicing these principles wherever I am. Use my life for good and for God and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.